In the opening weeks of 2789, Kiritan troops began pouring into the Kestrel and Marlette combat regions within the Crucis March. Warlord Jinjiro's invasion had already taken 60 worlds from the Federated Sons, making it the most successful campaign of the First Succession War so far. To assist in their continued advance, a handful of major supply depots were established in recently occupied systems to reduce travel times. The armed forces of the Federated Sons, who had suffered more losses than all the other successor states combined, were powerless to stop them at this phase of the war. In the neighbouring Capellan Confederation, Colonel Devlin was preparing to depart from Propus for another brutal strike against the Grand Duchy of Orient, this time at Calloway. His task force had been restructured and now included the vaunted Ares Titans and Red Lancers, within which served the Chancellor's sons, Balthazar and Barnabas. In a move that greatly worried the Capellan nobility, Barbara herself would also accompany her sons. Unfortunately for House Liao, SAFE had many agents operating within the proper system, and they kept the Free Worlds well informed of the developing situation. They didn't yet know where they would strike, but they divided the Navy's third fleet accordingly, and reserve units were moved forwards. When Task Force Devlin began moving in February, they awaited the call to reinforce whatever system they appeared in. As it happened, their target Calloway was garrisoned by a quartet of provincial regiments and the 1st Orient Provincial Squadron. The following month, the Free Worlds League launched what they hoped would be a decisive blow against the industrial capacity of House Steiner. Kenyan Malik's younger son Thaddeus had recently been promoted to Fleet Admiral and given command of the entire Lydon Front. He was looking to make a name for himself and believed he had an opportunity in Hesperus. Approximately one third of the Commonwealth's mech production took place within the massive factories on planet. Their continued operation allowed Steiner to expand the 2nd Lyran Guards Division to full strength, with one of the new regiments given to the Archon's son, Richard. Reviewing the prior battles, he concluded that Kirita and Davian had tried to have their cake and eat it by landing ground forces tasked with both the destruction of the facilities and with seizing spare parts. The third battle of Hesperus would instead be an all-naval affair. Thaddeus's fleet would engage the defenders and break off a pair of mass driver equipped cruisers to strike at the factories from orbit. His battle plan also called for his navy to materialize at a pirate point near the system's first planet, limiting the time Hesperus had to organize a defense. The strategy appeared to pay off when the Free Wells League Navy successfully arrived at the dangerous pirate point without incident, but fate was about to throw a spanner into the works. Arriving just days after Marek, Fleet Admiral Dewey of the Commonwealth Navy had come to relieve Weisskopf of Hesperus's defense. When he discovered the raid in progress, an immediate in-system jump took the pair of Lyran cruisers directly into orbit, just as the battle commenced. They were perfectly positioned to intercept the Soil-class vessels assigned to ground assault. After a broadside nearly destroyed his flagship, Dewey ordered his cruiser to ram the nearest vessel, dragging both down into the atmosphere. The other hostile soil was destroyed soon after. With the attack faltering, Thaddeus Malik was forced to call for a retreat, or risk losing the remainder of his fleet. Hesperus had been an embarrassing defeat for Kenyan's son, but he would go some way to repairing his reputation with the successful strike against the Dassault Shimon shipyards at New Earth later in the year destroying the orbital facility just months after it had fallen into Lyran hands. While this third battle would mark the last major raid against Hesperus during the First Succession War, it wasn't the end of the troubles for those on world. A guerrilla force known as Macredum's Devils had formed in the mountains from survivors of the 52nd Heavy Assault Regiment, the ex-SLDF mercenaries who had participated in the Kiritan assault. They had been disrupting operations on world for the past year, and it would take two more before the last of them were finally hunted down by the Hesperus guards. Not to be outdone by the Free Worlds League, the Draconis Combines staged their own raid against Steiner's Port Mosby, savaging the defenders and forcing the Lyran guards to have to rebuild their regiment from scratch. Thankfully, with Hesperus still operating at capacity, they were able to do this in short order. 
Within the newly conquered territory of the Draconis Combine, Warren's chargers found themselves behind enemy lines. They hatched a daring plan to destroy one of the staging posts Jinjiro was using to support his advance. They launched their raid on March 23rd, timed to coincide with a parade the Kiritans were performing in front of the media and news crews of half a dozen realms. When the attack began, cameras from across the Inner Sphere were there to see it. The chargers drew the combine mechs into the morass of stockpiled weapons, a place where any stray shot risked a massive chain reaction. Captain Warrant perished in the attack, but half his unit escaped. By then, more than a thousand tons of munitions had gone up in smoke, and two companies of the DCMS forces had been caught in the raging inferno. It was the first real blow the Federated Sons had dealt House Kirita. The material damage, though great, was insignificant compared to the effect on troop morale. In the aftermath, the Combine relocated that supply depot to Kintari 4. In March 2789, Task Force Devlin materialized at Callaway's Zenith jump point. The Orient Provincial Squadron immediately engaged them with a suicidal charge. While the majority of the fleet was still appearing around them, the half-dozen House Allison warships dove into the quagmire and targeted as many transport vessels as possible, destroying a full regiment of aerospace fighters and battle mechs before their inevitable demise. On approach to the planet, the transports were again intercepted by large numbers of enemy fighters and dropships, which eliminated a further two regiments. The CCAF still had a slight numbers advantage as the ground campaign commenced, but they were hampered by an overzealous Barbara Liao who insisted on taking to the field personally, despite her lack of combat experience. This forced Devlin to deploy more conservatively than he would have liked, and things soon turned against him. By the 10th day, the Red Lancers had lost two battalions, and the rest of the task force were in a similarly sorry state. Barbara reluctantly called for a withdrawal, and the survivors headed to their dropships. It was at this point they discovered that their entire jumpship detachment had been wiped out by the arriving Maddock fleet out at the Zenith. Devlin ordered a half dozen warships to break off and escort the Chancellor to safety, while he led the remainder of the fleet to engage the Free Wills League Navy head-on. Of the 24 vessels that battled the Marrick ships, just six made it out the other side, while the Free Wills Admiral lost a dozen of their own in the exchange. Jason Devlin himself was killed when his flagship was struck by a number of nuclear missiles. The Callaway debacle resulted in serious ramifications for Barbara Liao, both professional and personal. She had lost the support of both her government and the Stratahios, the armed forces high command. Furthermore, she had lost both her sons. The Confederation transitioned into a defensive posture in the months that followed. Crucially, they were forced to abandon their blockade of the Marek militia on Kori and Wazan, but not quickly enough to prevent the destruction of several more warships, in turn allowing the Eagle to resume his drive towards Sana. Kenyon's primary goal was to strengthen one of his closest supporters, House Orloff. The Duke of Carbonis had been living in exile within the Grand Duchy of Orient since the Age of War. They now prepared for a homecoming. Taking first the planet Oronson, destroying a Tikhonov regiment in the process, a trio of FWLM units next descended on Carbonus itself. The Seacaf and Merksin garrison were eliminated, and the Duke restored to his position. The Duchy of Orloff had expanded to include four new systems since the war began, helping them to raise an additional two regiments. Two months after Calloway, Kenyon Maddock sent the Chancellor a mocking letter, claiming that he was coming for Andurian next. The Stratahios was not fooled by the ruse and continued to fortify those worlds along his path to Sana. The Free Worlds League military was just as active on the Lyran front, targeting first the system of Murden off the Bolan Thun. Both sides used nuclear and chemical weapons extensively during the five-month campaign, meaning it was somewhat of a hollow victory for Maddock. To strengthen their control of the region, they hired on the mysterious Dark Spirits. This mercenary outfit had suddenly appeared within the Free Worlds and kept quiet about their history. We know now that they were actually the survivors of Darabont's Damned, a mercenary regiment that had fled the Amaris Empire in the final days of the Star League Civil War. 
Elsewhere on the front, the Free World seized Alula Australis in July. The Lyrans launched a retaliatory raid straight away against the Bolan defenders on Kamins. Unbeknownst to them, stationed on world was Kenya Malik's older son, Carl. The heir to the Free World's League would become an unintentional casualty of the raid, leaving his own son Jason Malik as Kenyan's successor. In September, the Lyran Commonwealth again came under attack from the Federated Sons. The remnants of the Second Battle of Hesperus, led by Admiral Hayes, first appeared within the Thorin system, where they caused as much damage to infrastructure as they could from orbit before departing. The stealths were known to be operating in the region, which prevented the AFFS from landing any forces. They next struck at Rocky, where upon arrival they discovered that the LCAF on world were in the midst of a manhunt for a rebel group of Amaris Empire armed forces. While Davian and Steiner engaged each other, the Amaris loyalists struck at the Lyran headquarters, prompting a nuclear response. Hayes in orbit responded in kind, and soon the planet was plunged into a nuclear winter. The exact death toll on Rocky isn't known. The last census, taken in 2765, before the fall of the Star League, reported a population of two and a quarter billion. Despite the mass exodus that followed the Civil War, it's probable that Rocky's population still numbered well over a billion, most of whom would perish in the crossfire. On the final leg of their return to the Federated Suns, the last of the task force destroyed the Dytron Heavy Industrials orbital shipyards within the new Earth system rendering useless the second of the two facilities Steiner had been so pleased to acquire. These minor victories were of little consolation to the collapsing Federated Suns. Throughout 2789, Jinjiro's advance had proven completely unstoppable. They abandoned early the defense of the Kestrel and the Marlette combat regions, and instead spent the year frantically fortifying the systems around their national capital. Those forces at the front tried in vain to hold their ground, but another two regiments were destroyed, and by year's end, the mustered soldiery were preparing to move into the new Avalon combat region. In their desperation, the Federated Sons launched a special operation that would become known as the Church Expedition. Departing from Pitkin in September, Church led his quintet of jumpships through the Outworlds Alliance and out into distant space. Their goal was to pick up the trail of Alexander Kerensky and somehow convince him to return so that he might aid the beleaguered Davian worlds. For months, they traced the path of jettisoned refuse, along the way discovering several distant colonies who had sighted the commanding general on his pilgrimage, including one of the former staging sites for the Rimworld secret army on Gutara. 130 light years further on, the trail finally turned cold. They had been searching for two years by this point, and their supplies were near exhausted. Defeated, the Commodore led his flotilla back home, unsure if the Federated Sons even still existed. In 2789, the first cracks appeared in the logistic and transport departments of the Inosphere militaries. Unlike today, where they are strictly off-limits, jumpships during the First Succession War were priority targets. The numbers available to the frontline commanders were swiftly depleting. To help maintain their offensives, civilian and commercial vessels were commandeered. The Lyran Commonwealth led the way in this practice. By the end of the year, approximately 50% of their merchant fleet was now operated by the LCAF. Other states soon followed their example. This had terrible knock-on effects. Many colonies that were relying on trade and supply runs to survive found themselves starving and without a means to escape the system. Perhaps the most infamous example of this occurred in the system then known as Dunkelwälder Dunkelflusser Schattenfeld. A decision to redesignate the unwieldy planetary name came at a time when systems were being struck off star maps as various cataclysms befell their worlds. Despite being far removed from the worst of the fighting, the people of Bob inadvertently caused their own downfall as vital food shipments were no longer dispatched in their direction. The population of 346 million were sentenced to an excruciatingly slow death by starvation, with over a quarter billion succumbing by war's end. 
In the modern era, less than a million people eke out a living on the surface of this inhospitable planet. One minor battle of Jinjiro's campaign that would have a lasting impact on the inner sphere took place on Embryol 3. Fighting for the planet had turned especially ugly, and facing the brunt of it were the Longhorn's mercenary regiment. They felt their employer, the Draconis Combine, was using them as cannon fodder, sending them on ever more dangerous assignments so that they wouldn't be alive to draw pay at the end of the campaign. This prompted the Longhorns to switch sides, bringing the Department of Military Intelligence a wealth of information on the Curitan battle plans. Quick to see an opportunity in the fallout was Comstar. In 2789, they founded the Mercenary Review Board. Employers and mercs could use them as a neutral arbitrator in an effort to ensure fair treatment. They only requested a modest 5% of the payment in exchange. In the centuries since its creation, Reputable mercenaries have insisted on involving Comstar in any contract negotiations, giving the Terran organization significant insights and influence on where mercenaries are deployed. With the successor states effectively forced to use sea bills to pay for both their communications and military spending, the soft power of Jerome Blake and Comstar continued to grow. This did not go unnoticed by the successor lords, and by late 2789, Kenya Malik had almost completed preparing for a strike on Terra. Throughout the year, the Free World's guards had been building up a massive stockpile of munitions on Procyon ahead of the attack. At this crucial moment, an unknown raiding force arrived on Weld and launched a precision strike against the depot, destroying thousands of tons of supplies then departed as swiftly as they had arrived. The loss of those vital supplies in the region made continuing with the invasion of Terra and assault on Comstar a foolhardy maneuver. Nobody has ever claimed responsibility for the raid. Throughout 2789, Davian had been gathering their naval strength in preparation of a major counter-offensive against Curita. Making up their numbers was half of New Avalon's own defence fleet. By year's end, over a hundred warships pulled from the Capellan and Torian borders had assembled at Arcadia, including the flagship of their entire navy, FSS Golden Lion. The purpose of this armada was not to liberate the captured systems, but to destroy as much of the Curita navy as possible. Without jump ships and warships to move the troops around, Jinjiro's advance would surely peter out. The fleet began by dividing itself between Admiral Kenneth Jones and Vice Admiral Marjorie Stone. Each would cut a path deep into occupied territory, cause what destruction they could inside of a week or two, drop supplies for any resistance movements they encountered, and then move on to their next target before Kirita could mount an effective response. After hitting their initial objectives, they would regroup at deserted Sholam, before heading for resupply at Rosamond. To coordinate their actions, each flagship was equipped with an extremely rare mobile HPG, two of just a handful still in operation post-Exodus. The counter-attack began in the first week of 2790, and met with early success. Six Curitan warships were destroyed in the first two months, at the cost of four Davian vessels. Better, they had captured one of the now rare Savetsky Soyuz class heavy cruisers. Furthermore, 22 jump ships and 25 dropships were destroyed, to only four and eight of their own. Curiously, they had yet to encounter any significant concentrations of the Draconis Combine Admiralty, but their massive fleets would no doubt make short work of any squadrons they stumbled upon especially once they regrouped at Shalam. Admiral Jones was the first to arrive at the meeting point on March 9th. When he appeared at the system zenith, he quickly realised that something was amiss. The Department of Military Intelligence had reported no Combine targets at Shalam, but the information had been fabricated by an ISF double agent, who was obscuring the system's actual purpose as a staging ground for the DCA fleet. Awaiting them at Shalam was a Kiritan armada of more than a hundred warships. While Jones's fleet was only arriving in dribs and drabs, Taisho Isaru Kalfani had his crews at battle stations, 
as they prepared to depart for the neighbouring worlds the Fed Sons had just attacked. When the DCA realised it wasn't them being ambushed, but rather the other way around, they broke off a third of their fleet to intercept the vulnerable FSN. Already closing range were their full complement of aerospace fighters. Kenneth now frantically dispatched a message to his counterpart aboard the Black Bear, urging her to divert their jumpships to the Nadir while she arrived in force to assist. His own jumpships were ordered to scuttle their vessels and abandon ship. Vice Admiral Stones' fleet materialised along the flank of the attacking vessels, catching them off guard. From there, the battle descended into a melee as the rest of the warships engaged one another. The conflagration drew on for six weeks, by which time it became apparent that both sides had lost the Battle of Sholam. When the last shot was fired on April 17th, 175 warships had been destroyed, gutting both the Draconis Combine Admiralty and Federated Sun's Navy. The carnage wrought by the First Succession War guaranteed they would never recover from that. A further 35 jump ships and 220 dropships were lost. Sadly, without the supplies the FSN fleet hoped to bring, some of the resistance groups withered on the vine. Fighting continued on Dobson, Galtor and Kintari, but the Gorgons on Franklin were wiped out, and the last mechs of Barlow's battalion were destroyed at Cusser later that year. The stubborn commander would continue to lead a small band of guerrillas for over a decade. Controlling the populace became almost impossible for the DCMS garrison, and by the end of the war, both sides had taken to calling the Cusser system Barlow's Folly. While the losses at Sholam were slightly worse for House Davian, a full 75% of their navy had been destroyed, they were actually the greatest beneficiary. Despite the extraordinary cost, they had succeeded in taking out virtually the entire Kiritan invasion fleet, putting an instant halt on all further advances. For his accomplishment, Admiral Kenneth Jones was posthumously awarded the Medal Excalibur. For his shame, Taisho Isoru Kalfani took his own life on April 30th. Of all the worlds in the Inner Sphere, perhaps the system over which the most blood has been spilled is Andurian. Marek and Liao had fought three separate wars over control of the region, and a fragile truce was only ever possible through the existence of the Star League. In 2790, the Free Wells League came to reclaim the planet which two centuries earlier they had voluntarily handed over. Nine warships, four regiments of mercenaries and two of regulars descended on the planet, completely overwhelming the defenders in less than a week, at the cost of only their soil-class heavy cruiser. The shocking seizure of one of their commonality capitals had the Capellan Strategios pointing fingers in every direction. The Eagle had humiliated them by seizing Andurian just as he had promised. Ingunish and Ryerson followed soon after, confirming that Maddock was opening a second front against the Capellan Confederation. Reclaiming the ancestral home of House Humphreys allowed the defenders of Andurian to form a 6th regiment for the Free Wells League military. Maddock saw similar success on their Corwood border, the Free Wells Guards and Regulan Hussars had been largely idle so far during the war. They now embarked on a massive raiding campaign against 10 Lyran Worlds. When they encountered little resistance, these raids transitioned into full invasions. Alhena, Dixie and Shiloh all changed hands in 2790. The Archon was hard pressed on our Spinwood border too. The Draconis Combine launched 8 opportunistic land grabs while well, LCAF reinforcements arrived to drive them off five of the captured systems, a trio fell under the banner of House Curita. Furthermore, another five systems were raided by the DCMS that year. The Commonwealth responded by launching an enormous raiding campaign of its own that July. Paul Steiner and Amanda Lestrade worked together to relieve the pressure on the beleaguered Federation of Sky by assigning their best units to targets in that region but other attacks were also underway. With Lestrade's focus on Sky, command of any operations in the Bolan Thumb was given to Commandant General Arik Hasseldorf, whose strategy was to mimic the heavy raiding going on elsewhere 
in preparation for a larger campaign. By August, the Freewilders had taken another world in the region, Radostov, but Hasseldorf would soon even the score. In September, he selected Valwar, the system protruding deepest into Lyran space, as his first target. When the Draconis Combine raided the Tamar Pact capital and destroyed the Bolson Tamar shipyards, it became clear that the Commonwealth's defensive stance was not working to keep them out of the war. Their heavy raiding campaign was insufficient, and so for the first time in three years, they would go on the offensive. Each theatre commander selected a trio of worlds for the first wave, and in November, a pair of mech regiments were dispatched to each. To show her commitment to this change in policy, Archon Jennifer Steiner herself would participate in the attack on Styx. Meanwhile, Commandant General Hasseldorf timed the first phase of his campaign to reclaim the Bowen Thumb to coincide with the attacks elsewhere on the border. As they had before, the Bolan defenders on Valois refused to surrender and fought a vicious guerrilla campaign out of the planet's jungles before the last of them were hunted down on the 23rd of December. Crucially, the LCAF were under strict orders not to use weapons of mass destruction. While this may have resulted in greater casualties among their own forces, keeping civilian losses to a minimum was going to be essential if the fanatical worlds of the Bolan Thumb were ever to be successfully repatriated into the Lyran Commonwealth. Jennifer Steiner and her escort arrived at Styx on December 12th, making landfall 10 days later. After quickly securing the major spaceports and eliminating most of the garrison, the government surrendered to the Lyran Commonwealth. On January 4th, 2791, the Archon turned her attention to the last holdouts clustered within a chemical weapons plant. Detonating the site from orbit risked spreading contaminants across the planet, and so instead, she led a ground assault against the facility. As she approached the main gates, booby traps exploded directly in front of her mech setting off an unintended chain reaction which collapsed most of the facility. Jennifer, in her command seat, was killed instantaneously. Her body never recovered from the blast. And with that, Jennifer Steiner becomes the first of the successor lords to lose her life during the Succession Wars, and she isn't going to be the last. This chapter also featured the last great fleet battle in Battletech. After this, the number of warships are going to continue to drop down. From now on, there's only going to be at most a squadron or so engaging each other, and before much longer, it'll only be ones or twos. Eventually, nothing left whatsoever. The pace is also going to pick up a little bit from this point on. These last three chapters we've only been doing one or at most two years in a single video. But from now on I think the next few are going to be five or more years uh, covered in each. If you've enjoyed today's video be sure to like, comment, subscribe, all that jazz. Uh, I always try to respond to as many comments as I can. And if you want more updates on how the series is progressing or you want early access to the next episode you can check out my Patreon link in the description below. Speaking of the next episode, we are coming up to one of the most infamous events in all of Battletech. Our next chapter, Eternal Dishonor, is going to be split into two halves. The first, I don't know, 60% of the runtime is on the next five years. But after that, we're going to slow right down and focus on one major event, the Kintari Massacre. That'll be coming out next weekend, so I hope you'll join me again soon for that. <laughs>